Today we'll be talking about the urinary system. Uh, the urinary system is divided up into two parts. The first part has to do with the kidney and the nephron. The second part has to do with the function of the kidney and the excretory ducts. Thank you. The urinary system part two, function and excretory ducts. Part two, we want to describe the structural organization of the ureter, urinary bladder, and urethra as part of excretory ducts and talk a little bit about function of the kidney. And we need to think about its architecture in terms of its function. We go to the cortex and the medulla, and then uh, it drains from the maxillary pyramid through the minor calyx, calyx major calyx, and through the, uh, to the ureter, as we'll talk about uh, later on. Here we see a little kidney from a little, little kid. We see the medulla the cortex uh, and the minor calyx. So uh, located in the cortex uh, uh, are nephrons. Some nephrons are mostly in the cortex, and it has only a thin loop of any. In contrast, other nephrons uh, juxtamaxillary next to the medulla, and they have long loop of pinleys. And if you were an animal that lived in desert, you would probably have more of these guys than other animals that do not live in an arid environment. And so uh, these have long loop of pinley. these are the short loop of pinley. So in the cortex, which is what this is, you can indeed find some thin portions of the loop of Henley. And, and we see some right there. <coughs> and you can see it. This is a thin portion of loop of Henley. You don't find it too often because it's very short compared to this very long one that reaches down into the medulla. So it's the cortical nephron, juxtamaxillary nephrons. Again, we can see it metalludin in blue. You have a high density of uh, proximal convoluted tubules. You can see all in through here, proximal convoluted tubule. A few distal tubules. Most of proximal tubules. There's the glomerulus. <clears throat> and indeed, you can see a thin portion of the loop of Henle. So you can find some thin portion of the loop of Henle in the cortex. And here we can see uh, the rate of, of uh, flow through the different portions of a nephron, proximal loop of the distal tubule, and the collecting tubule. And the greatest change in flow from 125 uh, mils per minute uh, to 20 or so is in the proximal tubule. And in fact, the proximal tubule absorbs about 80% uh, of, the, of the filtrate. The next large component is the distal tubule, but about 80%. And in fact, the tubule absorbed about 99%. For every 100 produced, you have about one mil of urine produced. So that brings us to our cortical nephrons and the juxtamaxillary nephrons. The cortical nephrons, we want to be like this because there's 180 liters of fluid filtrated every, every day. And you need to return that fluid back to the blood. So we need some mechanism to return the fluid quickly. In contrast, we want uh, the urine to be concentrated. So the juxtamaxillary nephrons are involved in concentration of the urine. So even though largely the nephron of the cortical nephron is in the cortex, its collecting duct also goes down through the medulla and benefits from a gradient that has set up uh, by this thin loop of penalty of the juxtamaxillary nephrons. Now, uh, if you see, uh, uh, for comparison, if you had a heat source that produced 100 calories per minute, and that added to a tube, a straight tube, it will increase the temperature about uh, 10 degrees, as you see there. So the heater added to it, heat increases it. However, if you have a hairpin loop like this, so that the heat going up can heat the one coming down, the same amount of heat produced in each of these would yield a higher uh, a higher uh, temperature within the bent tubes. 
And in fact, this is what happens in the cortical nephrons, is that for maximum removing of fluid, uh, you have something comparable to a straight tubule, even though this is a curled, it's not a nice hairpin loop uh, like you have with this long loop of Henle, which is characteristic of the juxtamaxillary nephron, is by which you can set up a gradient. Now, later on, we'll talk about that gradient is called a countercurrent multiplier. And so the loop. The hairpin loop increases the temperature over the straight tubule with the same amount of heat that's going in there. So in other words, if this was salt, you could have, or urea, you could have a higher concentration, uh, a gradient concentration here, that then once you run your collecting tubule down, you could benefit by uh, a reabsorption of, of, of fluid. So here we see the cortex with all the glomeruli up through there. Uh, this is where your arteries and veins would be, and this is where your vasorectate is running down through here. So these are vasorectate as opposed to the paratubic capillaries uh, that uh, go around uh, those in the cortex. Now, uh, the vasorectate are paratubic capillaries too. They are next to the tubules uh, as, as, as well. And so the paratubic capillaries, as we see here, that is the capillaries around the nephron, capillaries that we see here. This is the glomerulus, uh, the uh, afferent, afferent arterioles. About 180 liters per day is filtered through there. That's four times the reabsorption of venous in of all of the capillaries of the body. The paratuber capillaries, uh, the endothelial cells are extremely porous, so they can pick up fluid quickly. As I mentioned, there's a lot of fluid there, uh, which has gone to the filtrate, and you need to return it to the capillaries to return it to the blood. Uh, and osmotic pressure. So as the fluid goes, as the blood goes through the capillary, uh, the proteins are held back, uh, which increase the osmotic pressure, and that sucks uh, the fluid back into the capillaries and the paratuber capillaries. Low capillary pressure makes fluid want to go back there, uh, and the proximity of the uh, to the urinary tubules, namely that the Paratuber capillaries are very close to uh, the nephron, so uh, it's maximum absorption to uh, absorb these 180 liters of fluid a day. Also, the paratuber capillaries um, have fenestrated endothelium. You can see the endothelium right there below uh, the enfolded uh, distal or proximal tubules, as you can see in the paratuber capillaries. So in the cortex, we have the paratuber capillaries here, here. Uh, and here, uh, and in contrast, uh, in the medulla, uh, we have the vasorectae, vasorectae in through there, through there, as we can see going down uh, in the medulla, uh, and this has got the rich vascular supply, that way you can, you can follow uh, those. So the cortical nephron, juxtamaxillary nephron, and adjacent to all those, as we can see, uh, these are the loop of Henle, and through there you have blood capillaries. So these capillaries are paratuber next to, but also there's a vasorectate if it go down deep into the medulla. So this is in this region of a nephron that we're speaking of. And here we can see a 300 milliosmal, which is characteristic of saline. Uh, it enters in through there, and it also makes a hairpin loop, that is a vasorectate does. And it comes out, but the concentration, you can see the concentration is very similar to the outside, namely that the concentration of salts and urea and solids uh, is greater, 1,200 uh, milliosma as opposed to 300. However, as the fluid goes back, the salts go out of one into the other one from the exit to the entry, and that uh, amplifies the surface area. They, they amplifies the, the concentration there, which is com comparable with the surroundings. Uh, and you move only, you're leaving with 300 milliosmal. So you have a larger volume. You are removing fluid in through there, but you're not hauling away large amounts of salt other than that, what that corresponds to the amount of fluid, about 300 milliosmal. So you go in through there, you take water, water away, but you don't disturb the gradients by having a hairpin loop of the vasorectae. We call this a countercurrent exchanger. It exchanges with the countercurrent without disturbing the gradient. 
That's in contrast to the counter current multiplier. The counter current multiplier itself uh, is indeed the nephron. You got the uh, uh, different portions of the tubule, the proximal tubule, lupa finley, distal tubule, collecting tubule, uh, and the movement of salts and urea in and out will uh, set up a gradient that we see. And here we see the gradient 300 milliosmoles at the cortex, and then go down to 1200 uh, milliosmoles uh, in, in the, in, down in the medulla, and that would allow uh, the exchanger to not alter uh, the gradient that's set up by the multiplier, uh, and uh, so uh, all the tubes, regardless if they're cortical or juxtamaxillary, through their collecting duct, will benefit from this gradient concentrations in the medulla to uh, uh, to concentrate uh, the urine at the end. Now, as fluid comes down uh, through the tubule, there's a proximal tubule, a lupa venula, distal tubule, a collective tubule. Uh, the good stuff comes out in the beginning. Glucose is reabsorbed, amino acids, urea, protein, uh, 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 some water, uh, sodium, hydrogen ions are put into there. As you can see, the good stuff occurs usually in the beginning. If, if something filters through and you need it, it comes back in there. Some acids are added in through there. You can see some exchange of waters back and forth. Aldosterone uh, works in the distal tubule. Uh, antidiuretic hormone works uh, in the distal tubule and the collecting tubule. So the collecting tubule, as I mentioned, comes through uh, the, the, the medulla regardless of what type of nephron uh, that they've had. And that brings us to the glomerular apparatus, juxta near the glomerulus. And so uh, at the vascular pole, where you have the afferent and efferent arterioles going in, the distal tubule comes back up in that area. And uh, a modification of the distal tubule is the macula densa. This is an osmotic sensor. Uh, the fluid should be hypotonic at that time. If it's not hypotonic, it wants to increase the blood pressure. Uh, and it does that by signaling these cells, these are JG cells, the juxtaglomerular cells, which are modified smooth muscle cells in the afferent and some in the efferent uh, arteriole. And here we can see them. This is a distal tubule coming in through there and the afferent and arteriole. This is the glomerulus, Bowman space, distal tubule, and here we see some of the JG uh, cells. And here we can see again these cells right here. This is the urinary, the, the vascular pole in either case. And here we can see with the PAS staining, you can literally see the renin granules that are in there. So the renin is in these cells that's being produced uh, that will stimulate ultimately high blood pressure. And so here's renin. So you have uh, angiotensin, which is a plasma protein just floating around. When you release renin from the JG cells, these cells right here, modified smooth muscle cells in the wall uh, of the arteriole, that causes angiotensin 1 uh, uh, from the angiotensin. In angiotensin 1, there's another enzyme which makes it to angiotensin 2, which is the most potent vasoconstrictor. So angiotensin II in itself can cause vasoconstriction, which will increase blood pressure. Also, angiotensin II causes aldosterone release from the adrenals. And whenever you increase aldosterone from the adrenals, you increase sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule. Uh, that increases blood volume, uh, and that increases blood pressure. So you have a slower way of increasing blood pressure and immediate way of increasing blood pressure. Uh, and that is to um, to keep uh, the, the fluid in the distal tubule to be hypotonic uh, at the time it reaches up to the glomerulus. Uh, in adrenal function, aldosterone stimulates the sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule of the kidney, in the gastric mucosa, in the salivary glands, and in sweat glands. So anywhere you use, you use sodium, uh, to change the fluid inside there, uh, it's gonna, uh, the aldosterone will affect that. Antidiuretic hormone coming from the uh, posterior pituitary or the pars nervosa uh, will cause uh, antidiuretic hormone release from there, would stimulate the, the, 
distal tubule as well as the collecting tubule uh, to uh, remove water from uh, from this region, antidiuretic hormone to remove water from the from the filtrate. Now, protein urea, uh, several diseases may induce it in diseases such as diabetes. The glomerular filtrate is altered; it becomes more permeable to protein. So you have more proteins that can be uh, cleared out, so you get protein uh, in the is released in the urine itself. Usually, protein urea indicates uh, uh, disorders of the kidney. However, remember that 0 to 8 milligrams per decimal of protein in the urine is considered uh, normal. So the process is not 100% as a rule. Some proteins go through there and that's considered normal. Uh, but if you increase the permeability to proteins, you'll have a large amount that the nephron can reabsorb. So coming down from the uh, medulla, you got the, the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and then the ureter. ureter. Sometimes these, in, in some domestic animals especially, you have papillary ducts. So you have collecting ducts, go to papillary ducts, uh, and this would be uh, the, the minor calyx. Here we see in the kidney, this is a medulla cortex, uh, and this is a minor calyx. You can see the minor calyx with transitional epithelium uh, on either side. And from the minor calyx, you go to the ureter, ureter to the urinary bladder, uh, and here we can see transitional epithelium uh, in the ureter, as we see in through there. And here we can see the ureter, there's a transitional epithelium, lamina propria, and this is a, a smooth muscle, another layer of smooth muscle, and then you have an adventitious because you don't really want your ureters to be sliding back and forth with transitional epithelium. Here's another one, transitional epithelium. Uh, it's kind of scallop-like, uh, slit-like uh, uh, shape uh, of the ureter uh, muscle bundles and through their adventitial capsule around it. So from the ureter, you go to urinary bladder, to urethra, pro through the prostatic urethra, and then to the penal urethra in the case of the male. So here we see the transitional epithelium here and here and lots of smooth muscle of the urinary bladder. Here we see a smooth muscle of the urinary bladder and the epithelium, uh, transition epithelium on the surface. Now in contrast to ureters, the bladder has a serosa. It has a serosa because you want it to move back and forth as it fills uh, and, and, and empties. Uh, in addition to that, we have cells have to stretch as here we can see as the cells are stretched out whenever the bladder is full or they are, are coiled up. This is the surface. This is the plasma membrane that you through there. In order for some cells to have proteins stay together, they stick them together within the membrane itself. And that's what we have here. We have these little plaques that we threw here and that makes it make these little flattened vesicles. In fact, that's what's characteristic. So this little vesicles are continuous with the lumen. And so by forming these vesicles like that, it's able to allow the cell to stretch with actually pulling on the membrane itself. Instead of stretching the membrane, it unfolds the membrane to accommodate an empty or a full bladder. And that's due to the proteins that are in the wall that you don't have. Usually proteins migrate around, but if they're stuck together, they can't migrate around and make these little plaques that then bends that like that, and that makes it have these flattened vesicles, characteristics uh, of, the, of the urinary bladder. So here we see the bladder of a monkey. This is a muscle layer, uh, and through there is uh, the transitional epithelium on the surface, transitional epithelium on the supple, muscle layer, and nerve. Here we can see some nerve uh, in the layers controlling that a smooth muscle. And also on the outside, uh, we can see the mesothelium. This is the mesothelium on the outside uh, where the serosa is. Then you have the, the penourethra. The urethra, after you come to the prostatic urethra, you get the penourethra in the case of the male. Uh, and, uh, and so then we have this carbonosis tissue that uh, fills up with blood associated with, uh, with the erection. But here we see the urethra 
up from where the blood's going through very thin skin as we see there this is uh, from a monkey uh, and it had just one of these uh, carbonosis uh, erectile tissue type but here you see the urethra uh, as well so in a study guide proximal tubules have certain characteristics uh, distal tubules do too collecting uh, the, the different portion of loop of family capillaries collecting ducts all those have characteristics of which are useful to to observe in addition uh, to urine sometimes something else comes out uh, in the urine in this case the sperm and here we can see a little study this is 24-hour urine sample this is a sperm the number of sperm in a 24-hour urine sample and so these are the numbers of sperm that can appear uh, in the urine. You can see there's no spermic here until about nine days. Nine days of sexual no, of sexual rest, no sexual activity during this time. All of a sudden, uh, sperm will uh, will spill out uh, into the urine. So in summary, we have a cortex and the medulla, and the cortical uh, nephrons and juxtamaxillary nephrons. Uh, which have a vasa recta and which have a long loop of Henle. Uh, in terms of the different tubules, approximate tubules, you return your glucose, your protein, your amino acids, important things are returned uh, if they're filtered through. Inulin, you see, goes right straight, straight through. Urea is lost uh, in the nephron. Some things are added to the nephron, as you can see, but the cortical and juxtamaxillary nephrons are important. Uh, and one, the cortical nephrons remove a lot of fluid, like a straight tube, as opposed to maxillary nephron sets up a gradient with a, uh, the countercurrent exchanger, uh, as we see here. Uh, and then, of course, the proximal tubule uh, has the greatest absorption. About 80% of the fluid occurs in the proximal tubule. So uh, back to the function, overall function of the urinary system, rid the body of waste. You want to uh, preserve its constancy of extracellular fluid. Uh, and then also uh, it has an intercom function with erythropoietin and renin uh, produced. We want to thank uh, the many sources uh, from which images were modified for this presentation. I really didn't make any of these, even though I did take some pictures. Uh, most of these came from textbooks and websites and, uh, and magazines. So that's the end of Urinary System 2. Uh, this is my wife's horse, Sam. She has two horses, but that's one of those. Thank you.